Live from Miami Beach, Florida, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering .next Conference, brought to you by Nutanix. Now your host, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to steamy Miami. Miami. We're here at the Nutanix Next Conf, uh, Nutanix inaugural user conference, almost a thousand people here, a lot of energy, a lot of disruption going on. A little tension between VMware and Nutanix, which is Nutanix is embracing. Uh, Matt Eastwood is here, he's Senior Vice President at IDC, focusing on all things infrastructure. Matt, it's great to see you again. Thanks for coming back in theCUBE. Thanks Dave, it's a pleasure, it's fun to be here. So yeah, it's a good, good conference, you know. Stu and I were saying we do a lot of these, and, and usually the inaugural ones are just like kind of big hackathons, and you know, this is very well orchestrated, nice hotel, great food, yep. good customers. What's your take on, on Next? Well, I thought um, the keynotes were very well done today, and so it was, uh, you know, as an analyst, it was really nice to see them lay out um, a vision, but also product behind that vision that really kind of extends their story. Um, right up front, they were very clear that they were uncomfortable kind of being boxed in with a definite, you know, kind of a defined market space around uh, hyperconverged, and clearly they see themselves as players, you know, really across the data center, across, across, uh, you know the layers, the layers of the data center, but also extending out into the cloud across that virtualization layer into the cloud. So that was really fun to see, and uh, I think the audience really, really received it well. Yeah, companies like Nutanix kind of challenge your business because you've got to, you know, you've got to put things in that have very tight definitions. If you don't have tight definitions, then what's the point of you know, your numbers? So, yeah. so how do you? I mean, I don't know who coined hyperconverged. I heard this morning it was a rune in Asia. I thought it was Steve Chambers. Uh, could have been you, I don't know. But anyway, regardless, it doesn't really matter. You guys use the term. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you had a market scape up there. Uh, Nutanix was showing that today um, with the term hyperconverged. So you, you, do you size that space per se? Or? We, we've, um, yeah, so we're setting up uh, the tracking of that market, but at, at this point we've, we've done some forecasting. So we forecasted this market to grow pretty dramatically from uh, I think uh, 800 plus million in 2015 to a billion and a half next year, and then it kind of builds on out beyond that to north of three billion. But the uh, the, the broader space, the the overall what market that people would refer to as converged or IDC has used the term in integrated, it's really incredibly fluid. So you have uh, you know these these big plays, you know the the, the what VC you know did with with v Block and what um, NetApp did with FlexPod, and then of course Oracle with their Exa. But now you have this, this, this kind of really, all this momentum in the market in the middle that's really around these infrastructures that are increasingly software defined, uh, that are going to put an awful lot of architectural pressure on what had been a market that was really more about integration than, than anything else. But these, so these markets are changing really fast. So the hyperconverged is a subset of the overall integrated, what you guys yeah, call yeah. integrated, right? So obviously integrated is going to be much, much larger. Mm. We've talked about this before. The TAM for integrated is essentially everything, <laughs> right? All storage servers and, yeah, and exactly. networking. What, what's your thinking on what percent? Think out even I don't care. Give me a number of ten years. You know, spitball number. What percent of that business do you think will be integrated in some way, shape, or form? Even from a reference architecture all the way to a, you know close to, to a SKU or hyper-converged, what, what percent do you think are going to go in that direction? Um, pretty significant, so I, I would start first by also kind of picking up on a few themes from this morning where if you think about what x86 has meant to the server market, massive amount of transformation in the market, which led to lots of standardization but also lots of uh, merchant software running on those systems, and then of course we had the, you know, the, the Linux and open source movement on top of that, and then more recently the virtualization movement on top. So if you kind of build off of that, um, it's a very, very significant part of the market that's addressable in this in this space. I think um, what I heard from Nutanix yesterday is if you take the kind of the hyper the uh, the I guess hyperscale piece of this off the table, and you know assume that the Amazons and Googles and the Microsofts of the world are going to do things in, in a somewhat different way, and you look at the more traditional enterprise market, uh, the the mix here uh, becomes pretty significant. I would say you're looking at a you know up, upwards of 50 percent of the market that will move in this direction in, in the next five years. And then the guys who don't move, why are they not moving? It's just they like to have sort of a roll your own? Um, yeah. They so, get good, good seats to the Sox game? <laughs> I mean, a combination of things? I, I mean, I think, so um, part of it is, you know, I, in any end user conversation, I think we've talked about this in the past too, 
you really want to kind of ground the conversation in a couple of different planes. One is what's happening kind of um, on-prem, what's happening off, and then what's happening kind of in a traditional you know, vein, and what's happening in a shared pooled, set of pooled resources. And what you see, of course, is all the growth is in the upper half of that, that kind of quadrant in the shared resource, and more and more of it's actually been happening off-prem, but you, what you really need to do is give the end user a, a lot of room to run in terms of how they, they um, create efficiencies around their traditional applications and move them into these pooled infrastructures, make them easier to manage. A lot of the attack cost here is, is actually people. It's going after the, the sysadmin expense of managing these very discrete infrastructures. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, uh, you know, when we, we've talked about you know, hyperscale invading the enterprise, uh, one of the numbers you, you and I have talked about is you know, how many servers can I manage per person? Uh, Facebook at the Open Compute Summit uh, said that they have, you know, it's an order of magnitude, you know, 10, 20,000 servers per admin, but that's not a guy that you know, really configures and does more. I mean, they bring it in by the rack, they have a bunch of guys that do it. When right. it's done, they turn it off, they, they throw it out. So you know, the role of you know, what compute is and how I manage it's different. Um, our, our forecast is actually that I think within the next five years, you know, we think two thirds of you know stuff that customers own will be in some sort of converge because people want simple. You and do. if you take the, you know you, you've tracked a lot of the how much is going into the hyperscale guys, that means you know how much is left is just a standalone. I'm going to buy a server or a couple of servers is changed. I mean, what 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 do you see kind of macro level that that hyperscale and you know service provider and enterprise? Well, I think you, you touched on. Important point, Stu, which is you still see massive differences in between what's going on in the enterprise and what's going on in the hyperscalers. The enterprises will tell you that they're managing 75, 100 servers per admin, and the hyperscalers are you know well in the thousands. Um, they also tend to. I think the other thing we should probably tee up here is what might happen next in the infrastructure itself, in terms of you have a bunch of different com, you know kind of competitive threats and forces on the market. One of which is disaggregation. You know, the move towards a, a more of a disaggregated set of resources where you can start to think discreetly about how compute, memory, and disk is applied to a workload. Um, so HP last week even talked about composable, that kind of a, that kind of a, a story. You hear Intel talking about rack scale, so there's a lot of that happening in the marketplace. But I think um, in terms of really what the end user wants to do, and I think the Nutanix team has said this quite well, the focus on differentiation really moves into data and into apps. So how do you differentiate with the data you have on your, on your customers and on your market, and, and how do you differentiate using new types of applications, say mobile engagement? And the differentiation is not in the infrastructure, so you want to make that easy, and you want to make that something that is, is but, you know, can, can really done, be done super, super simply to allow the speed that needs to happen in the business on top to go faster. Yeah, I, I want to get your opinion. One of the criticisms of hyperconverged as a category is that you know it's your compute and storage together. Nutanix talked about how it's not a homogeneous single block that they have flexibility. They have compute heavy. They have storage heavy. But at the end of the day, there is some linkage between my compute and my storage, and you know. What part of the market does that hit? Are there, you know, is, you know, certain environments where I want to just scale compute and scale storage separately? What, what's your take on, on yeah, that mix? I mean, they, you're right. They they laid out that kind of two by two today, where they looked at compute heavy, storage heavy. They looked at, you know, kind of the i the i o the i ops or the i o intensity on the uh, workload itself. Um, I do think that is very much how end users think, but of course when you're using these uh, standard building blocks, you, you can't hit all those range of workloads with a, single, with a single physical piece of hardware. So today, I think what they're laying out in terms of, I don't know, was it five or, five or six different uh, physical configs to cover the landscape is completely reasonable. Even in Facebook, which you mentioned earlier, they, um, they have five physical uh, deployment types that they use for their range of workloads, and you could argue that their range of workloads is a bit more uh, homogeneous than what you might find in an enterprise. So I think that's a very reasonable starting point. I do think that over time, as some of these next-gen architectures build out, on the you know physical architectures build out, you'll probably see the ability to mix and max, match on the fly the resources to the workload in real time a bit more. But that's still out there three, five years. Yeah. So right, at Facebook it has five uh, you know configurations at any one point because they do refresh that on a pretty regular base. 
What's the impact on all this on, on the chip makers themselves? I mean, Intel, you know, there's been a run on you know, consolidation in, in the chip world, you know, Intel, the Avago Broadcom stuff, you know, what, what's, the, what's the ripple to those component uh, pieces for, for th this change in the marketplace? Well, the biggest, I mean, we've, if you kind of look over the last 10 years and what's happened with the shift to virtualize and consolidate, what that tended to drive was um, higher end bin SKUs for the, on the CPU side, so Intel, even though they weren't selling maybe the unit volumes that they thought they would back 10 or 15 years ago, they actually saw a pretty nice margin opportunity in, uh, in that consolidation shift that was happening. Um, I think Intel will see, they'll see some uh, potential pressure on their data center business in places where they don't have a, a strong footprint today, so networking would be a, a good example where you could start to see as the uh, networking fabric begins to standardize, you could start to see influence more on the ARM side there. Um, you will start to see even some of the edge tier computing layers also start to see some pressure from alternative uh, technologies. But but the, the acquisitions that are happening in the space are very much uh, of the mindset that you're going to have um, bigger physical footprints that are consolidated in these, these mega hyperscale data centers, which can be increasingly optimized, not just through software, but also through how you attach acceleration hardware with the, with the, so the kind of the CPU, GPU model, if you will. And so there's a real opportunity to differentiate there as well for Intel. So we heard the uh, Gartner guy, Ray, Ray Paquette, I think his name is, um, talking about mode one and mode two. It sounded, I tweeted out, it sounds a lot like IDC's platform two, platform three. I don't know who beat who the punch, <laughs> but I, you've been talking platform two and three for a while now. Uh, they're similar in, in concept. Uh, Diraj, when we asked them about it, said, we're, in your parlance, platform 2.5, you know, kind of a David Goulden yeah, sure. statement. He's yeah. there using, you know, mode 1.5, um, which I found interesting. You would have thought that they say, oh no, we're platform three, but his point was, OpenStack is platform three, and look at what happened to Nebula and others who sort of over-rotated in there, so what are you seeing in terms from a standpoint of the practitioner? How are they dealing with, you know, again, uh, uh, Poquette talked about that this morning, this sort of transition from one to the other, this bimodal organization. Are you guys seeing that? And, and how are organizations putting a veneer, or are they putting a veneer on the old stuff to make it look like the new stuff? Well, I think um, that's kind of where the, the struggle is in the market today, so if you think about that, two by two construct I made around on and off-prem and, and yeah. traditional and shared. Um, three of those boxes are really addressable as you know, kind of extensions of the 2.0 to 2.5, where 2.5 really sort of suggests that you're trying to get more efficient, you're trying to automate a lot more of the, um, the management of the, of the overall shared pool, if you will, without using the cloud word. But when you start to think about really where we're heading and where the investment is going to happen more and more is in these, these cloud native or next gen applications which are increasingly uh, you know, built for frameworks and really aren't really uh, you know, kind of coded down into the hardware, into the systems. And so I think that we're still very early days in, in the enterprise in developing some of these, you know, really what we would call third platform type applications. And IDC also likes to use the third platform story as a way to kind of indicate where the where the innovation in the market could move on top. And so we talk more and more about um, uh, innovation accelerators on top of that third platform. So things like robotics and cognitive computing and other kind of advanced uses of technology, really that will extend deeper into the business. And so I think we're very, very early days in kind of what technology will mean to the business as you start to drive instrumentation deeper and deeper into the business and change the business model to one that's really more around life cycle services that are really optimized through some sort of digital transformation. Yeah, so that's a great point. I mean, it's the combinations of technologies on top of that, that platform that are ultimately going to drive innovation. And so then, you know, it begs the conversation, okay, what, is that, what does that infrastructure look like? I, I would think, just in listening to you speak, that, well, okay, think about who's, who's well positioned. Obviously, the guys like Amazon who are doing virtually, you know, they started in platform three and, and proving a business model they are well positioned, but, you look what IBM's doing with Bluemix, um, you know, with, on top of Cloud Foundry, HP to a certain extent, although they don't have the developers. Microsoft, for sure, is in a very strong position, one, one would think, to bridge from you know, past the future. Uh, John Furrier asked Pat Gelsinger, are you a halfway house? I thought Pat was going to clothesline John when he asked him <laughs> that, but um, you know, it's interesting to watch <laughs> VMware sort of evolve from what you call platform two to platform three and be that 2.5. 
And it's also interesting to see Nutanix trying to accelerate some of the things that maybe VMware is putting the brakes on. You know, VMware talks about OpenStack, they talk about you know, containers, <laughs> they talk about all these sort of platform three innovations, uh, and they, they join, but ultimately one looks back and says, well, maybe they're trying to freeze the market, slow things down so that they can catch up. What are your, what are your thoughts on what's going on between Nutanix and VMware? Well, I think um, you touched on a couple of, you know, even, I've even heard Joe Tucci kind of refer to VMware as a bridge from second to third, so maybe not a halfway yeah. house, but still <laughs> kind of a bridge. But I think if, you, if, you're, if you're an end user, or you're a vendor that's trying to attack this market, and this is very much what Nutanix is trying to do, you want to play to a, a number of core advocates that you have in the data center, or in the infrastructure that can help you with that transition. And so if you think about what VMware did, VMware did, built a, a really nice ecosystem of sysadmins that were empowered by the technology, and they really pulled that technology in. And then what's happened more recently with, with some of the shifts to, towards this uh, converged or integrated building block has resulted in the need for very dynamic shifts in how the organizations are, are, are set up and managed. So the compute, the storage, the networking teams needed to be brought together, and, and you needed also to bring in a high level um, architect or, or, or VP of infrastructure to really kind of bridge some of the gaps that were happening. I think what Nutanix is, is playing on, or could play on, is the ability for that sysadmin down, here, down at, the, at a at grassroots level to continue a transformation in the data center that happens in a way that's, a, to use their term, a bit more invisible. It just sort of happens at, because it happens at a price point or at a, at, a, at a friction point that's a lot lower in the organization than what maybe it takes to drive a really high level million dollar plus kind of, a, you know, kind of integrated strategy into the data center. So that will be an interesting thing to, to watch, is just kind of how fluid this plays out in the data center. Now the other thing too is that, you know, there's the little rift, I call it the urinary Olympics, uh, between VMware and, and, and Nutanix, small, yeah. you know, Chuck Hollis blog type of stuff. But you know, with Evo Rail, we had DRAJ last year, I said, hey, what do you think? He's like, okay, you know, game on. It justifies what we're doing. Uh, but, but Nutanix chose not to be an OEM for a VMware, so they don't resell VMware licenses. And he was on theCUBE today, he said, because we don't want to compete with our partners. Okay, the, what he didn't say, which is also, I think, a fact, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it, maybe it's not a fact, my opinion, is that they don't want to be a reseller of VMware because it's a crappy business. And you look at HP now, I mean, HP used to claim, oh, we were the largest reseller of, of VMware, IBM used to claim the same thing, and I think they've got to be looking at their businesses now and going, so what? You know, that's not, we want to be a platform company. We don't want to be a reseller of, exactly. of technology. And so Nutanix has made that decision, and I think that's, that's pretty bold. I wonder what you, you would think about that. I think, um, I think it's wise. I mean, there's certainly, one of the things I also heard loud and clear this week is that uh, one of the ways that Nutanix intends to grow their business is by allowing their partners to differentiate more on, on top of the platform. So, you know, that if there's a ding from Nutanix towards VMware with Evo, it's that Evo doesn't allow as much differentiation in the platform. It also doesn't allow, you could argue, as much opportunity to share in the profit pool with VMware in that, in that market uh, as well. So I think that's, that's a big part of what Nutanix is trying to operationalize around, is give a, a, a smaller group of strategic partners. So what I kind of heard from Nutanix this week is, yes, they've got Dell in place, they clearly see an opportunity for another global OEM partner, and they also see opportunities for regional OEMs to help them in China or Japan or Europe, say. Um, so they're very focused on, on building partnerships that allow those, those, uh, those, those partners to really differentiate in, in how they bring the technology to, to market. But yeah, they don't want to, clearly you don't want to just get in the business of reselling somebody else's technology. In fact, really what we're talking about here is control. And so you know, the, con the control point continues to move up the stack and you want to be uh, at, you know, at front and center at that point of control as that moves it's, up. It's control and it's margin. Stu, what, how about the VMware perspective on this though? So I can imagine VMware saying, well, we know that homogeneity is an advantage for the hyperscale guys and we're trying to drive homogeneity and we, we, we can be the iPhone of, of the enterprise. Yeah, what, what but, do you think but, 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 but the problem is, is if you look at the reality, if we, you know, we talk to users today, um, most customers have multiple hypervisors and most customers have multiple clouds, multi-hypervisor, multi-cloud world, and there's a huge opportunity in the management space of all this, which is where Nutanix is going all in with XCP, Prism, and Acropolis. Um, so, 
I, I, I tell you, Acropolis, I think, is going to get a lot of conversations. It's, you know, KVM-based hypervisor. Maybe I can move around and everything. Most customers I talk to that have VMware are pretty happy with it. Sure. They're not necessarily fleeing. Sure, there's costs there that maybe I can save, but, you know, OpenStack tried to pull that away for years to KVM. So, you know, yes, there's some opportunity there. I, I thought, you know, when the, the full vision's unveiled and I have my virtualized workloads, my containerized workloads, and my cloud-based workloads, if I can manage all those together, you know, that's pretty special. Absolutely. I'm curious, what's, what's your whole take on, on Acropolis? What's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, ultimately, if you want to play the, you want to play that customer choice card, that's that's the right way to go at the market. And, um, you know, I think, if you if you kind of look at how virtualization's played out over the last 10 or 12 years, um, what you, you frequently heard, even from VMware customers, you know, even eight or 10 years ago, was, that it was great technology, it was helping them save an all, awful lot of money, but it was expensive. And where you start, to, where they actually start to feel that expense is when you get to a point where you're you know, 85, 90, 95% virtualized, and all of a sudden, virtualization is no longer a tool to help you save money, it's something that's baked into your baseline cost. And I think that's an area where Nutanix has the opportunity to kind of pivot. And, and help shift that conversation a bit. And so what you typically tend to see when people get, uh, you know, kind of maybe start to feel that way is they, they shift into a more of a converged infrastructure as a way to get even more efficient with the infrastructure itself, or they start to look at multiple hypervisors and kind of broadening out how they think about yeah, usage and, and for various workloads. Um, and I think Nutanix is trying to play both ways. They're giving customers choice on the hypervisor, but they're also giving them an opportunity to chase a lower cost infrastructure that maybe has higher rates utilization yeah, I, I just I wonder that that management play is a pretty lofty goal um, because if you look, you know, VMware's you know has their management. They've bought a number of companies. Cisco's bought a number of companies. Microsoft wants to be the center of your universe. Yes. Um, and you know nobody has done it. I you know I, I I joke always as an analyst. I can always say you know that the two things that are always holding us back are management and security. And uh, you know d does does Nutanix <coughs> have the right and the talent to be able to be an important part of that discussion? Um, yeah, I mean I think that's. I think that's a, a really well asked question and probably not something we can answer in, <laughs> in a short segment on the cube, but it's uh, I, I think I think they're they've done a nice job creating a lot of buzz around their business, around their technology, and now they're ex extending the conversation beyond just the uh, you know, what they talked about yesterday was making making storage invisible was kind of their, their first phase. Second phase is now extending into making that whole virtualization layer invisible, introducing more choice, and then broadening that out to the cloud. Um, I mean, I think there's a nice story there, but obviously as you broaden that story out, the number of points of intersection uh, competitively in the market grows significantly. And, you know, this is a, these are complex data centers that we're talking about that, like it or not, are actually on some evolutionary path. They're not, they're not generally revolutionary, rip and replace type of, type of plays. Well, and yeah. I think the other big challenge that Nutanix will have, you know, maybe IPO will help a little bit, but it's the big guys will just steal their, their, their messaging. Now you're going to hear the same, you already are hearing it right, from, right. from VMware, and their customers say, okay, well, and I think Vinod Kosla said it. He said everybody's sort of risk averse, and IT are risk averse. That's Very not much gonna, so. Nutanix not going to change that alone. What what could change it is you know Amazon, the cloud, Docker, you know DevOps. I mean those things, but they're still slow to change. And so EMC, IBM, HP, VMware, Microsoft, they're all going to be saying the same thing, and they've got huge footprints. Right, trust me, you know, we can do this right, too. And they don't really have any incentive to drive that transformation any faster than it needs to happen, right? So they're going to play to that conservatism where they can. Uh, so Ravi Matre, I asked him, well, will we see a multi-billion dollar company emerge from the core enterprise space, not Amazon eating into it or Google or Facebook, but from the core? He said, absolutely, the, the conditions are there. I, I'm not so sure, I mean, I see this oligopoly you know, they get big, Cisco buys them, HP buys them, IBM buys them, EMC buys them, or whomever, VMware, Microsoft. What do you think? Do you think we'll see? I mean, we all want to see it. But yeah, will we, we see I mean, another we, NetApp emerge? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And you, you go through these waves of the last round of, you know, storage startups all were acquired, and now you've got a couple of interesting plays out there in the market now, whether it's um, Nutanix or Pure or, or Nimbla, you know, that, or they, you know, where are they going to end up in the end of the day? I, I, you know, I think really what Nutanix is signaling, I mean, I think a lot of people kind of misread it initially and saw it as an, you know, kind of appliance, software and hardware together. They're clearly a software company. Yeah, right. and, and I think you could, you know, a lot of people rotated to it and said, well, who's going to, you know, who would acquire Nutanix? You know, there have been a lot of rumors about Cisco. There have been a lot of rumors that, you know, you know Dell got in early. 
Um, but you could argue that Microsoft would, would be a, you know that could could gain as much as anybody from from acquiring uh, an, an asset like Nutanix over time. Microsoft, I, IBM. Yeah, I, you yeah. know, but they're not going to over. IBM tends not to overpay for right, an asset right. like that. Nor yeah. would, you know, I, I was just Matt. I, I love your point there because when Deeraj yeah. compared himself against the competition, it's not a storage discussion, and really the opportunity in this space is to be that software, be that you know systems level. Uh, Deeraj says they're not quite ready to be called a platform company. There's a lot of work they need to do. We like that kind of humble nature, but uh, yeah, absolutely. If they're you know a big software player, because I mean a, you know multi-billion dollar company, VMware, you know came out of you know where, where they started yeah. and is now you know a, you know a major force uh, in the environment. Yeah, so, I asked, you know, I asked a five billion dollar run rate. Yeah, out I of asked there would be yeah. another net, net app. Will there be another VMware? Would be a, would have been a better better question. And in the number of software companies that get to run rates north of a couple billion is pretty limited. I mean, for VMware right. to do what it did and get to five billion is impressive. Yeah. Um, now, what VMware needs to do is, you know, continue to drive the transformation, of, you know, well above the hypervisor, you know, NSX, like you mentioned, Stu, and certainly what vSAN and even with vCloud Air. I mean, they're they're talking about the same types of transformations in the data center, but the story gets a lot more challenging because the competition changes when you when you get into any one of those veins. It's complicated, it's challenging, users now complain that, okay, that every time I turn around, VMware's you know, taking attacks, or they're putting a new product in my face, but that's natural, VMware has to grow. If you're Pat Gelsinger, you got to keep expanding your exactly. time. Yeah. So, as long as they add value, I, I, think, I think VMware is the gold standard. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, they're hands down. You know the best <laughs> with the, what they and do. And there's a lot of there's a lot of good customer loyalty there yeah. too. So yeah. So, all right, Matt, we have to leave it there. Awesome segment as usual. Thanks right. very much for coming Thanks, on the guys. cube. Appreciate, appreciate it. all the insight that you're providing and the the framing of the market sizing. So really great great work that you guys do. So appreciate it. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be right back from Miami. This is the Nutanix Next Conf. We'll be right back. This is the cube. <laughs>